Okay, this is going to be the last of a series of three lectures on model discovery. And I'd actually like to illustrate this by going back to the Lorenz equations, which is what we started with, uh, or we started thinking about to, to describe this, which is a time series data, and I want to discover Lorenz or Van der Poel or any of these equations that I might have in my system. Um, and so how, and how we've done it so far is you just take that time series data, you posit a library of candidate functions, and you essentially construct an AX equal to B problem. So, and then you do a sparse regression and you find that it actually works remarkably well to discover a lot of governing equations, provided you don't have too much noise in the system and that you can compute derivatives fairly nicely. But there's one thing that we need to start to address right away, is when you measure a system, so now if you really go to try to apply this in real systems, if you measure a system, how do you know you're measuring all the right variables or how do you even know you're measuring all the variables you need, right? So another way to say that is, in the Lorenz, we assumed I had access to the full state space, x, y, and z. Now I'm going to assume I don't have access to the full state space. What's going to happen now? Can I still make progress to try to discover the underlying dynamics, even though I no longer can access the full state space? Okay, this is a really important problem. It addresses this idea of latent variables. Latent variables are those variables you don't have access to. They're hidden from you. Okay? But we still need to be able to construct models. Real life has lots of latent variables everywhere, yet we still need to make inferences and decisions and predictions around them. So that's what we're going to do here. And how we're going to do this is using this trick of what's called time delay embedding. I'm going to show you how it works. So first of all, let's go ahead and start off with the Lorenz. So what I'm going to do, set up a time series. I'm going to solve Lorenz from time 0 to in steps of 0.01 to 100. Okay, that's my time series data. Some initial condition, 5, 5, 5. Okay, so I'm going to run this thing out. I'm going to get lots of time series data uh, and with some just generic initial conditions. So one trajectory of this thing. And so let's go ahead and run it out. Uh, T, Y, let's call this Y is my solution coming out of this thing, is equal to OD45. I'm going to call on the right-hand side, let's call it lower, right-hand side, and then I'm going to send in my time and my next knot. Okay, and my right-hand side function is right here. Here it is. I also have to send in sigma, B, and R. Okay. So values for those, uh, reasonable values for those we've had before, I believe are 10, 8 thirds, and 28. So let's go ahead and put those in and the outside of this loop. But this is it. So this is my right-hand side. So reasonable values there. So I've got to send in here. So uh, first of all, I'm not going to send anything here. And the way I'm sending these things in here, sigma br. And what we can do is actually just send in values directly, or say sigma is equal to 10, b is equal to 8 thirds, and r is equal to 28. For instance, that's what we've been playing around with. It's going to give us some, you know, this strange attractor. Okay? So I send in those values, I solve. And the first thing I'm going to do is let's just look at what we're getting, and then we'll talk about the setup of this thing. So the x variable is just the first column of this. And the y variable is just the second column of this. And z is the third column. Okay? So I can do plot 3 and show me the trajectory of t. Uh, so there's a couple things I can do. First of all, x, y, z, and uh, line width. Two. So let's just prop that and grid on. So let's run this piece of the code first. So there we go. So let me pop this down and just have this code. All right, so so far, all right, so we find we have a little Lorenz integrator, right? And we can rotate this around. 
And there you go. So this is the dynamical trajectory in the x, y, and z space. I have access in this case, in this visualization, to all the variables, x, y, and z. Okay? So what we're going to start to change about this is, suppose I only have access to x. Right? I, don't, I don't see y and z. How do I even know there's a y and z? Okay? So that's the kind of question we're going to start to ask. Because generically, if you approach many systems, like let's say in biology especially, you're making brain measurements, you're main, let's say measuring voltage recordings, how many dimensions of the, in the data are there? What's the intrinsic rank of the dynamics? How many other variables are you missing in your measurement? These are really important questions to ask because you're trying to build on a model, a model around that voltage activity, and you don't even know how many variables you're missing. It's important that you get a handle on how many variables you might be missing. Okay? So that's what we're going to try to get after here. So another viewpoint of this then says, okay, that's my plot three. I can also plot here the time series data. That's what I'm actually going to work with. Plot. Uh, in fact, let's do subfigure, subplot, 3, 1, 1. And we'll do plot t versus x, line width 2. And we'll just copy and paste these. Uh, oops. There. And in the second, we'll plot y and z. Okay? So this are the measurements. These are the measurements not in this space, but now I'm just looking at straight up time series measurements of this system. In for over this time span, and there they are, x, y, z. Okay, so before we usually change that, show the sort of our butterfly attractor picture, right? This is, uh, you know, this is just pe plotting these parametrically, but the reason I show it specifically like this is for this reason. I have x, y, and z, these are my three independent variables that are interacting in that dynamical system, okay? And in fact, if you do the Cindy regression, the ODE find regression on this, you can recover the dynamical system, which is the Lorentz equations, okay? Just by doing, setting up AX equal to B, backslash, and thresholding, whatever you want to do. So it, you'll get this, okay? And you can handle a modest amount of noise, and you still get it. But now, the question is, suppose I only gave you that. So all you see is X. You don't even know these other variables exist. So we're going to take that off the table. We're going to say you are blinded to any other information. All you have is one or two, whatever, how many other time series you have, the point here being all you have is this measurement, and from that measurement, your objective is to infer something more about the system. Of course, doing discovery like we did previously, where we write down the model, kind of seems impossible at this point. I don't even have Y and Z time series data. The question is, really, what can I still do on model discovery to tell me that maybe there's these other variables that exist, and can I still figure out a way to characterize the system and make future state predictions? Okay, so that's the goal. All right, so let's go ahead and get rid of this, plot of these. So what are we going to do? Well, what I'm going to do is start going with this idea of time delay embedding. What time delay embedding is, is take the time series, and then in the next row, shift it over by delta t. And then in the next row, shift it over by 2 delta t, and then 3 delta t. And you construct what's called the Hankel matrix. And interestingly, every time you shift it, the x time series has in it encoded information about the y and the z time series. That's just a fact, right? The, the, the dynamics are interacting. They're buried in there somehow. The time delay embedding is somehow giving you information about these other variables that are present in the system. So what we're going to do is construct this Hankel matrix. It's called H. And we deal more with the Hankel matrix when we talk about Koopman theory, right? And this is something that we, uh, we can think about with DMD and the DMD and Koopman and embedding note, uh, lecture sets that are also attached to this, the class webpage. So if you want to go look a little bit more about 
Hankel and Bettings, there's some more lectures there as well about time delays. And all I'm going to do here, though, is take this, let's say, the first 5,000 points of x, okay? And take the, remember, x is a big uh, column vector. I'm going to take the first 5,000 points and I'm going to lay it on its side. So it's going to be a row in this matrix. That's the first row. The second row is 2 to 5,001. Third row, 3 to 5,002. And see, all your, see er, the, what, the only difference between these rows is a shift in time. And what we're going to do here is you can see that if I do this shifting, what my hope is to do is to take a look at this matrix and learn something about the system. Six, oop, four, that's a five here. And that's a six here. Oops, sorry. And we'll do all the way, we'll do all the way to um, eight here. Perfect. I just made a matrix with eight rows, 5,000 columns. The Hankel matrix. Every row is a time shift delta t of the previous rows above it. Okay? So what can we learn from this matrix? So the first thing I want to do with this matrix is a singular value decomposition. I want to go look at this matrix and see what is the singular value. How, if I take this matrix like this, what's the rank of that matrix? So that's what we're going to do. So H is the, Han is the Hankel matrix, and turns out we can learn a great deal from the SVD of this time delay embedded matrix. So here's the SVD of H. It's going to be an economy SVD. Keep that simple. And what I'm going to plot first and foremost is plot the diag of S divided by the sum of the diag of S. Okay. Oop. And this will be, where is that going to go? Okay, I need diag of S. Yeah, okay. Um, make sure I got all my things lined up here. Red dots line width 3. Oop. So I got one parentheses missing. Oh, I see. I wanted one more here. So there we go. Okay. And let's go ahead and run it. So now what I'm going to do is going to run this thing, and I'm going to plot the singular values out of this matrix. So this is my original data here. Let's kill that off. Kill this off too. And all I care about right now is looking at this matrix here, or this picture of the singular values. So the first thing you see is that when you do the singular value decomposition of this matrix, there's one very dominant mode that has accounts for about 88% of the variance. There's no, another mode down here which gets you about 11%. This guy here, I don't know, maybe 1% or 2%, and then everybody else just seems to be pretty small. Okay? They're not quite zero because that, that's not how it works, but you can see there's a rank to this system, and it seems like the first three modes dominate. Make an argument to just the first two modes, but that third mode is being lifted off. So we're going to count it, okay? And so we're going to truncate here and say, wow, those first three modes, this seems to be a rank three system. Why don't we go look at those three modes and what they're telling us? Because in some sense, the advocation here is if you take a signal in time, like X out of a system XYZ, when you time delay in bed and you look at that, the rank of that Hankel matrix, it's telling you something about the, in, the number of terms that are actually there. In other words, the intrinsic dynamical rank that's there. And we know it's three because it was x, y, and z, and here's the signature, okay? So I can start saying, wait a minute, this gives me information about what the stuff I didn't measure, that there's these other variables, y and z, in there. I can't re reconstruct y and z necessarily, but I can infer they exist. I'm seeing a shadow of y and z, okay? through this time delay embedding. So let's go look at what these structures look like. So what I'm going to do next is just start plotting the 
some of these things. So first of all, let's plot the first uh, five columns of that matrix. So these are time delay embeddings. Okay? So, you know, now we're looking at the left singular vector, the U matrix columns. Now, normally what we do when we think about SVD, this gives you this subspace that you're going to embed your data in. But now the subspace we're going to be looking at is X itself time delayed on itself. So it's a weird kind of subspace, but I do want to show you the structure here. It's quite remarkable. Here they are. So these functions are interesting. Here's the thing I want to point out. The first function looks like this blue constant. The second mode looks like that line. The third is this yellow parabola. And where is our Then we have the cubic and the quartic. These look like just simply polynomials. Degree 0, degree 1, degree 2, all the way up. Very interesting. So this time delay embedding of this single variable produces essentially a polynomial basis set. That's an observation. Okay? There's more of this if you follow some of the papers that we link to in the, in, in the web, on the website for the course. Just follow there. There's a trail of other further reading. So I won't comment too much about this here. Okay? So that's a kind of interesting observation. That's your eigenspace. But the more important thing is, what about the time series? What I'm going to do here is I'm now going to plot for you the three dominant time series. So that's the right singular vectors, right? The V, the columns of V. So it tells me what's going on in time. And I want to ask, in this time delay embedded system, what do the time dynamics look like? So I have a way to get to it here. I'm going to go ahead and just look at the dominant three modes. Because when I did the SVD, three modes dominated. And those are the ones. And let's look at what they look like. So if I do this, run it, you'll see here, this is what it looks like. Oh, let's grid on first, too. And what I'll do is I'll start coming out some of these other figures so we just get the ones I want. We can take all these out here. So all we're going to get now are two figures, figure one and figure five which are two different versions of really the same thing. So in this time delay embedding coordinate system, this is what I get. Okay? So this is somehow a warped representation of this. So this one here, right, this is the full x, y, z. This one here is now in this time delay embedding coordinate system. And it's got this very interesting structure. But you can see it inherits its structure from the full dynamics here. Clearly, that's what's happening, right? So this time to bit lay embedding, even though I don't have access to Y and Z directly, you can clearly see that this three-mode truncation is giving me a shadow of the manifold that, where this thing lives. So this is important. It's telling me a couple things. If I only have x measurements, then I can say something like, when I do this time delay embedding and look at the rank, and it seems to suggest, oh, this is a rank 3 system. That means I'm probably missing a y and a z. Now, I'm not going to really cover them directly, but now I have a way to start constructing dynamics in this system, okay? which is this time delay embedding system gives me something very interesting to look at. There's more that's here, though. This is Another remarkable thing that I want to show you about this time delay embedding. Oops, sorry. Let's go here to figure 6. So figure 6, what I'm going to look at is I'm going to look at where I truncated. I'm going to look at V. So I'm going to look at uh, actually V, uh, the fourth time mode.
And I'm also going to plot on here, remember that this has 5,000 points, right? That's because that's kind of what we put into the time delay embedding from 1 to 5,000. I'm also going to plot on here uh, my first, my uh, x time series, just the first 5,000 points. Okay? And let's take a look. Oop. I think I, let's, let's actually first, uh, I have a mistake here. Hold on one second. Let me just do this first. Let me just plot this for a moment. So, oop. Oh, sorry. Missing a parenthesis there. Okay. So I can probably just go back and do this. All right. Okay, I got a... So right now, what I'm plotting for you is the orange is the X time series, and this is... This is that V vector, and you can see it's very small. So I'm gonna have to let me just multiply it by a factor of uh, uh, maybe a hundred, just to make it bigger. And let's just see if that will get me to the right thing. Okay, good. In fact, let me just do a little bit more, 300. So here's my point in showing you this. <coughs> I had a remainder. So I'm going to truncate with three modes. And with those three modes, I'm throwing er everything else away. So let me get rid of this for a minute, get rid of this. So I just have this figure here. So what I'm showing you here is the actual X dynamics. And overlaid on it is this V, right, multiplied by a factor of 300 just to sort of blow it up and have it look on the same scale. And here's what I want to show you. The blue is just kind of popping around, and every time my X switches lobes, remember, on this attractor, I'm here, I'm here, this is what the Lorenz does, you switch lobes. Every time I switch lobes, this fourth mode where I truncated spikes. Kind of remarkable. In fact, I want to show you a zoom in of this because how it spikes becomes very interesting. So let's look at a, a like a time series here. A couple things I want to highlight. Right before it jumps, I get a spike as a precursor to when I jump this thing. Okay? So in fact, if you follow the references below, the lectures here on the website, course website, you'll find one to Havoc. And what you find is you can start then writing the Lorentz model, even though you don't know the equations in terms of this time delay embedding coordinate system where this fourth mode acts as a forcing to the a linear system. Okay? And in fact, you have a predictor when it's on its last trajectory around a lobe, this V variable, this where we truncated the fourth mode, gives you a spike telling you it's going to actually jump to the next. So you have a prediction window before it jumps to the next lobe and it acts as a control signal for the 3x3 three three embedding. So this is a kind of a remarkable thing. And again, this is an equation-free. I, I don't know the equation for x. I don't know that there was even a y and z initially. All I gave you was a time series of x. And your job was to extract what can I learn from the system. Things you learned with time delay embedding. First, the system seems to be intrinsically a rank 3 system. We knew that was true but it actually found this for us. The fourth mode where you truncate seems to act as a control signal to that linear 3x3 three three system we had and creates the transitions that you obs actually observe in practice. And we also have a shadow of the dynamics in this space. So we don't actually see the full uh, embedding that you would for the Lorenz attractor, but we see a shadow of it. So so many things we can learn without having the governing equations and without even having known the rank of the system ahead of time. All I had was one time series measurement. So this is a really powerful technique, uh, especially when you have a large latent variable space or a latent variable space that really uh, produces a lot of uh, impact on your dynamics. And this is a way to get at it. And it's a very practical piece when you especially start thinking about complex systems like biology, computational neuroscience, things of this nature. 
Okay, that's it for now. The code is right there. You can play around with it and have fun. Okay.